So good day to everybody. Uh, welcome to today's CEOs uh, uh, Cultural Economics uh, online seminar, uh, which is part of the Association for Cultural Economics International Activities. I am Elisabetta Lazzaro, uh, the CEOs coordinator, professor of creative and cultural industries management at the Business School for the Creative Industries uh, University for the Creative Arts UK. And this morning is quite early here in London, it's just past five o'clock. Uh, mm -hmm. So this uh, uh, CEOs uh, uh, is a real global CEOs. This is why uh, we are so early in Europe, because uh, we have presenters uh, uh, spanning from uh, California to India and uh, Australia and Taiwan. Uh, in order to talk about uh, social values in cultural entrepreneurship, uh, theory and practice. Uh, um, our presenters of today are Juani Walker, Associate Professor of Communication at Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. Hit Godazara, founder of Impact Gifts My Startup. Uh, based in India. Uh, Hita and Juani recently published in the Journal of Social Entrepreneurship uh, uh, the paper Transformational Development and Social Capital, J. Paul Rux and Graham Vikas on both sides uh, of the threshold. Uh, and uh, they will be accompanied by uh, Rumayi Mohan, who is uh, a development executive at J. Paul uh, Rux Foundation in India. The second presentation will be contributed by Alex Yuyu Chang, who is Associate Professor at the Institute of International Management, and Jason Potts, uh, an economist at uh, RMIT in uh, uh, Melbourne, Australia. And uh, we are still waiting for him, and we hope that we'll uh, show up uh, uh, soon. So let's not uh, hesitate and let's give the floor uh, to Juani, Heat and Rumai uh, for the first presentation. Thank you. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for introducing me, Elizabeth, and you know bringing us all together on this global platform of Association of Cultural Economics International. Uh, mm -hmm. I think to have this increasingly important discussion on the topic of culture, cultural entrepreneurship, and its sort of uh, economic, like global economic impact. So, well, uh, I would like to drive straight into the presentation to discuss about our today's topic of social values uh, in cultural entrepreneurship uh, by conversing both about the theory and the practice of it. So, talking about one of my favorite enterprises, uh, Jaipur Rugs, which is India's largest hand knotted uh, drug manufacturer, which was founded uh, in the year 1978 by Nandikishore Chaudhary, he's also known as NKC, uh, where in his own words, he describes business to love, uh, where it has the potential to create and preserve uh, a civilization. And talking about civilization, culture and cultural wealth are deeply integrated into it. So um, uh, as he says that business is next to love, we can actually see his love getting translated uh, in the capacity, uh, in the way where he sort of, you know, focuses in the capacity uh, on the bottom of the pyramid, uh, where Jaipur Rak sort of believes in transforming uh, and utilizing the fullest potential of the underserved community uh, by creating impactful business. So here is a bird's eye view uh, of how this conscious luxury brand is creating global impact. So Jaipur Rugs has a family of more than 40,000 artisans uh, working across five states in India, uh, which are uh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Bihar, uh, and Jharkhand. So we sort of you know, make products across these five states, we connect them, connect these artisans across 60 plus countries uh, uh, around the globe. 
So this is sort of the overall, you know, bird's eye view of our impact globally. Uh, talking about, you know, let's zoom in and have the zoomed in perspective about how we work at uh, the grassroots level where our global sort of conscious luxury brand adopts uh, this social entrepreneurship model where we, uh, Jaipur Rugs, sort of provide livelihood uh, to the remotest village uh, in the five states of India. Uh, we do this by sort of supplying uh, raw materials straight to the villages by providing them door-to-door -door entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, while doing so, uh, we also sort of make them uh, produce these rugs and we connect these artisans directly uh, to the global customers by eliminating the middlemen. And when I say we are eliminating middlemen, uh, there has been, uh, you know, previously middlemen were known to be exploiting these artisans. So what we do here is that we sort of eliminate the middlemen and directly connect our artisans to the global customers. And we also provide them dignity uh, by socially developmental, uh, you know, benefits to our Jaipur Drugs Foundation. So uh, this is sort of like a zoomed in perspective how we work at the grassroots level at Jaipur Drugs. But here we come to the main question of how Jaipur Drugs is an exemplary example of cultural enterprise. So in the previous slides, we discussed on how it is a conscious luxury brand on the global scale, but on the functional perspective, it is a social enterprise, right? So while I was doing my thesis, I studied the differences uh, between differences and the similarities between social and cultural enterprises. And I can say that uh, a social enterprise is an umbrella concept under which uh, cultural enterprise functions, where interestingly, Jaipur Rugs core sort of lies in, uh, that is basically of cultural enterprise. So across three, all of these three dimensions, Jaipur Rugs sort of vertically integrates its cultural wealth of traditional practice of rug weaving, which is about 2,500 year old, right? So Jaipur Rugs leverages this cultural wealth and connects the local artisans globally through enhancing their creative capacities. And in the following slides, we'll see how they do it uh, uh, more efficiently. So over to you, he. Thank you. So now let's look at how our cultural values constituted at Jaipur Rugs. And uh, to look at that, we, in regards to our investigation, I was able to personally visit Jaipur Rugs in 2017 and uh, visit conduct ethnographic interviews with the artisans, with the founder NKC, and kind of draw on from grassroots firsthand research, which was also backed up by secondary uh, research and data from 100 publications. And uh, for our research, we kind of drew on the definition of social capital from literature review. And uh, the attributes was the biggest part as uh, we tried to look at different attributes of social capital that were at Jaipur Rugs. Also on that previous slide, there was a definition of social capital, which we can go back to as that might become an important thing. Oh, there it is. So at the bottom of that slide. Um, so this was much of what we were interested in is essentially how Jaipur Rugs, as well as a comparative organization, scale up social capital through micro practices or communication practices. So on to the next slide. Here are essentially our findings. We had analyzed the data doing a thematic analysis, looking at the uh, themes that were important across the secondary and the primary data. And in order to make sense of what we found, um, I used uh, or introduced in our discussion as Heat and I worked together, um, two different sister theories of um, CCO, which is constitutive communication theories. And um, in particular, there was one of those theories, CCO, um, that is referred to as the Montreal School. Um, Taylor et al. essentially made observations that communication can be used in order to scale up an organization to essentially take the dream of an organization of founders' ideas and literally scale it up into um, organizational practices. 
Um, he also refers to that ladder of progression as six degrees of separation, which is kind of a common term that we sometimes know, but he uses it theoretically. So I want to focus in this slide of our findings and our analysis using the um, six degrees of separation. So you'll see in the example slide here where I have this single quote, these were the quotes that emerged in the analysis that represented an increasing distanciation, distanciation or materialization of the ideas beginning at the first degree of the founder NKC with his early soul searching and philosophies, his family's orientation with entrepreneurship, as well as um, Hindu concepts and his own spiritual sense of finding oneself through losing oneself. This was the inspiration of why he wanted to start Jaipur Rugs. Um, and then that ideal became materialized in the framing of responsible manufacturing, which is the second degree of um, separation or of becoming more materialized. Essentially, um, as he observed, it was women who in managing their own homes and um, doing work, um, weaving, that they had the tacit skills to be able to operate and manage um, so based on the work that these women were already doing, these weavers, as well as who had good values that he aligned with, um, he essentially created more of an emphasis on corporate social responsibility, but using instead the terms of responsible manufacturing. As the organization progressed, we saw themes and terms, family blessing became more and more of an important concept. Um, as the organization sought to not just have the Chaudhry family blessing, um, but to be able to extend that then um, to the Weaver class and to use that terminology even of extending family blessing of a Weaver um, all the way to the luxury purchaser. The language has um, progressively become more specialized, um, even to present day where the term of weaving lives um, they're not just weaving rugs, but they're weaving lives that became important terminology, not just in terms of their understanding, but in the way in which they structured and began to integrate the stories and the processes of the weavers more directly into the organization's operations. And fifth, um, the materialization of the organization became much more rooted in the Chaudhry family with each um, Chaudhry child and one um, uh, son-in-law at the organization. And then ultimately, the sixth degree of separation, we see the more full formalization, the materialization of those early ideals in the form of a rug and those physical manifestations. All right, and then last, this is the last part that we'll just hit on for now. Um, even though we had formerly focused on McPhee et al.'s four flows, the sister theory of constitutive communication, we focused on how that really elaborated the comparison organization of Graham Vickus. Um, in our recommendations section, not in table form in the study, but in our recommendations, we really saw that um, these first two horizontal rows or first two flows of communication were being very well established um, also at Jaipur Rugs, but that the activity coordination, which is how the organization is going to have more tacit styles of organizing, as well as how those weavers uh, would actually become more integrated into the global society had not yet fully evolved, which is why we didn't fully extrapolate the use of this theory in our findings, but yet in our recommendations, we do recommend that Jaipur Rugs invest more in those last two flows of activity coordination and institutional positioning. In this slide, we kind of give our recommendations as we looked at other social enterprises in India around three themes, which is maintaining bonding, enhancing bridging, and developing linking. And uh, these were the three kind of realms that we uh, provided recommendation in terms of looking at dignity, mindfulness, uh, increasing participatory decision, uh, increasing learning, unlearning, and relearning processes at a structure, and then integrating weavers into the creative and organizational processes at any social enterprise. 
So uh, going ahead from the recommendations, uh, we come to our next question as to how we are becoming a global cultural enterprise. Uh, by actually, uh, as Keith and uh, Dr. Walker said, we are actually weaving stories for social and cultural impact. Uh, we are making them being heard across the globe by taking our stories of our artisans. And we are actually uh, successfully, uh, uh, con we have converted them, uh, their mere identity from laborer to artisans. And now we are on this mission to make them artists by enhancing their creative capacities. So uh, here is how we do that, is that we sort of have this initiative called Manshaha, which is a Hindi word which translates to made from uh, your heart's desire. Uh, so in this particular project, we sort of let them be the Picassos of their own drugs. So we allow them to design their own drugs by weaving their own stories, their emotions, and their loves. So here is an example of uh, love and equality weaved in this beautiful story of this couple showing a social and cultural uh, sort of impact. Uh, so here is a story of two distinct uh, patterns which you can see in this particular rug called Savan Kalaharia. The rug is a beautiful story of the chemistry of this uh, husband wife, uh, Prem Ch uh, Bhak Chand and uh, Parvati. Uh, well, Bhak Chand is uh, let his imagination flow with his expertise in this particular rug weaving industry uh, with very delicate patterns which you can see in the left uh, bottom. And Parvati, you know, sort of starts making uh, this abstract pattern of rainfall. Uh, so as Park Chan is a very, you know, expert in this rug weaving, uh, he sort of insists his wife to follow his uh, design, a dedicated design, a detailed pattern. But Parvati denies to follow him because uh, she's like, okay, this is Manchaha. I would like to really uh, design the way I want to because that's what my heart says. Uh, so to fight and to break this tug of war, the neighbors were to be called to vote for which is the best uh, design. So they liked Parvati's work more because it was a little different, it was unique. And just like every husband uh, has to give up on the fights with their wives, uh, Bhakchan started uh, following his wife's pattern of design. And that's where Savan Kalaria was created. And this is actually an award-winning drug, a global award-winning drug uh, at Shepherd Drugs. So, there is another project which we do uh, called the Freedom Manshaha, which is a collection that uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you please yeah. uh, uh, conclude because we have to, to switch yes. to the second presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so yeah, this is basically a uh, story. This is the last section which I would uh, finish up. So uh, this is the collection that liberates a section of society set up for failure, where we are celebrating the creation of the jail inmates uh, weavers. So every rug sort of showcases the potential and the imagination uh, to motivate and add prestige and prosperity, creating a society where sort of equality, justice, and peace prevail. So here is a very short 30 seconds video, which showcases uh, one of our weavers motion towards how he has sort of weaved in uh, his wife's love. I'm I'm afraid, uh, we, we don't have time. Uh, we must, I'm sorry, we, we don't have time. All right. You, because I uh, think has to to go to to class. Uh, so if you can please. All right. So yeah. yeah. So I think we have numerous stories to tell about Jaipur drugs, and uh, of course, uh, we can go and visit the website uh, to find out more about Jaipur drugs. So here is our uh, small gesture of talking about Jaipur drugs and how it's an example of uh, cultural entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a very uh, insightful uh, case study, uh, very nicely presented, presented uh, very nice uh, rugs, by the way. Um, now, uh, let's switch to the second presentation by Alex Yu Chang and Jason Potts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we haven't heard um, uh, from uh, Jason. We hope that he's doing well. Um, I forgot to mention, um, Eliana, that Alex and Jason uh, uh, recently uh, published uh, together with uh, Yu Yushi uh, uh, the paper, The Market for Meaning, a new entrepreneurial approach to creative industries dynamics 
in the journal of cultural economics. Uh, so Alex, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Elisabetta. So um, let me share my screen. All right, is that good? Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, uh, cool. Again, thank you guys. And uh, um, uh, I'm Yu Yu Chang, Foundation of Chenggong University. And I must say that this is my great pleasure to uh, be here. And uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for the, the kind invitation. I mean, this is a great honor being here to share our recent paper that uh, Elizabeth just mentioned, which was published in the Journal of Cultural Economics. And then, um, uh, sorry for uh, rushing the, uh, uh, the, the, the first batch of authors because uh, actually I just postponed uh, inform my TA to postpone the class for 15 minutes. So I, I think I can stay uh, until two, uh, sorry, um, you know, GMD time, like 6.10 or 6.15. All right, so um, I, I mean, this is a great pleasure to be here uh, talking about uh, the, the idea behind our paper, the market for meaning. And in this paper, we try to uh, propose uh, the new theories to understand how uh, cultural values is transformed into the uh, economics value. Um, so uh, as, uh, I think this paper was published in uh, 2009, uh, 2021, I guess, but uh, we, have, we actually have been uh, working on this paper for more than three years because this is not uh, uh, empirical paper. We based on the theoretical um, developments and also we use um, the we try to merge different uh, concepts different theories different streams of theory from economics from cultural developments and then uh, um, I'm, we are very thankful to the uh, review review reviewers team and the editorial boards from the journals so we keep improving the papers so after several rounds of reviews we very lucky it's uh, concepted in the uh, in the journal. So first of all, let's, let's quickly review some key theories in the cultural economics and also in cultural entrepreneurship. Uh, I think this is a famous one from David Frosby in Australia. They're talking about uh, how the ideas and the value from the cultural industry evolves. So from David Frosby's theory, every, most of the um, values from cultural creative industries are from the some core creative arts like uh, literature, music, performing arts, and visual arts. Those kind of cultural elements evolve and expand to the outer layers of cultural industry, which also involve higher profitability and um, more lucrative business, such as advertising, agriculture, uh, architecture, design, and fashion. So we can see that dynamics between the pure uh, cultural elements and the, um, the more profitable cultural business. So this is the second theory that we review, which is about the cultural geog geography, which uh, focus on how the cultural elements are produced in the uh, cultural markets. So, and you also talk about how it diffuse across different kinds of region. And third one is, uh, we try to understand how some uh, cultural producers, such as artists, turn to become the uh, entrepreneurs in their fields. So we can see the tension between Cultural, produ cultural produ productions and uh, founding a new business. Most of the cultural entrepreneurs, they reject the idea of commercializing their products and uh, because that may uh, deviate from their uh, original thoughts of becoming or devoting to the arts. So we try to understand, we try to borrow some theories from the economics uh, literature. And the um, most important one would be the Schumpeterian entrepreneurs, which consider the artists of Schumpeterian entrepreneurs. They propose uh, some creative disruption to the existing paradigm of industry, and then they got the attention from the cultural markets. But, most, but mostly these theories are used to uh, explain the idea of uh, some utility-based products like computers, pro any kind of products, but cultural industry focuses more on the symbolic value, which is very subjective and uh, cannot be easily measured. So uh, we also use uh, the, the theories of the social network markets uh, published also in the Journal of, of Cultural Economics in 2008 by my co-author, Jason Potts. And this theory talks more about uh, how premises externality is formed in the cultural and creative industries. The more people understand the meaning behind 
the culture production, the better um, the, be the better chance they are going to appreciate the symbolic value carried by the cultural production. So all those theories are inferential and they got a lot of citations, but uh, we still cannot identify the mechanism that can transfer and explain how cultural value are transformed into the market value. So this is the reason why we try to propose a new theory. They try to combine, they uh, try to get away uh, or a departure from this Schumpeterian conception of the this kind of heroic and visionary creator of cultural ideas. But we focus more on the, the role played by the cultural entrepreneurs, which it, we call it the Catholicarian uh, Catholicarian entrepreneurs in cultural industry. Their job is not to uh, really generate the great idea that disrupts the existing industry, but they have to identify the meaning, um, the subject intersubjective meaning in the existing cultural industry. So we call that we call this process the market dis discovery process. So um, the reason why we propose this is that um, um, unlike the most of the industries values cannot be easily measured in the cultural industry. We don't really know the uncertainty of the value, uh, value evaluation is super high. So we try to, uh, try to explain the mechanism that uh, um, the new cultural concepts, the new cultural creation can be understood by the, uh, the its general audience. So the symbolic meaning and the, the, meaning, the value of the meaning behind this cultural creation could be very important. And this is the reason why we propose this cultural economic trajectory, which includes three phrases. Cultural production, where uh, the artists create novel contents that form the new intersubjective meaning in the cultural market, markets through the audience transaction and their experience. So when we are exposed to a certain cultural products, we will naturally form our con concept, our feelings for the uh, cultural pr products. And then in the second phrase, uh, we have to go through the all the cultural production need to go through uh, the, the stage of value discovery, which means that uh, the entrepreneurs they have to discover, test, and refine the cultural meanings to create the objectivity and the market equilibrium. Market e equilibrium here means that um, um, if the meanings are um, strange and uh, unfamiliar by the the cultural audience, they can really understand the value behind that. But uh, if so, the job of entrepreneur is to identify the opportunity to to convey the implicit meaning, the cultural elements to uh, the markets. So the interaction between the cultural audience still matter because we don't really judge the cultural the quality of the cultural production by ourselves. Instead we interact with people, people talk about that and uh, how people collectively form the intersubjectivity of their cultural meaning also matters. So this is the job of the cultural entrepreneurs to really establish that kind of equilibrium. And then only when the cultural elements and the cultural production ideas can survive the stage and then uh, these ideas and the value can be retained in the, the cultural institution within a specific market. So that uh, when the cultural meaning is institutionalized into markets and become a new cultural elements, they, have, they are going to have the chance to feed back into the, uh, the next stage of the cultural production. As you can see right here, here is the new emergence, the new cultural elements that will feed back to the new content creation. So the cultural production is the, in our papers uh, is proposed, uh, we suggested that um, Cultural production process is a combination of the existing cultural elements and the creative inputs of the cultural artists. But in our arguments, we also found that uh, the, the cultural artist, the artist is not necessary to become the, the cultural entrepreneurs. The, the, role, the job of cultural entrepreneur is to identify the connection between the, how to establish the intersubjectivity in the existing cultural markets. So in this paper, we, this is a relatively long paper. So we, uh, in, we explain the whole process in the very detail. We talk about how uh, some, act, some initiatives and activities should be done in order to produce, in order to include the existing cultural elements in order to, to reach the cultural production process. So uh, as I just mentioned, 
this, this may involve several uh, parts of that, such as cultural elements and the artist's creativity, and also where and how the cultural ideas and creative contents are created still ma also matter. Like some important, uh, you know, where you are from can give you the legit legitimacy in creating the cultural content. So the contextual idiosyncrasy also can determine the, the quality and uh, some unique attributes of the cultural uh, creative content. Also, we, if the cultural artist can include the technological developments so they can enrich how the, the experience of the cultural audience, how they expose to that cultural elements. And then most important thing is that uh, the artists themselves have to bury the job, the responsibility to interpret the subjective meaning they are going to inject inject in this cultural production. And then the next step will be how they can better socialize, socially construct the intersubject meanings. So here comes the second stage, that's the formation of the cultural meaning, where we call this a cultural discovery. So in this uh, stage, uh, we propose that um, um, uh, the cultural entrepreneurs need to record it recalibrate the intersubjective meaning in the suboptimal market configurations. So not only they have to create the, the elements, but also they have to adjust the uh, general public's understanding about the meaning, implicit meaning behind the cultural production. So a lot of marketing uh, activities are needed. And then um, we have to, uh, the idea behind our argument is that uh, the products and services in the cultural markets we don't really provide our cultural audience with value by giving them the, the products or providing with the surface. Instead, by using the products or experiencing the surface, they form the meanings behind that kind of cultural, uh, cultural ideas to fulfill the spiritual satisfaction, their self-fulfillment or their identity constructions. So this kind of expressive value instead of the utilitarian value. So um, in our paper, we propose that uh, there are several activities that should be done in order to discover, discover the meanings of the cultural products, such as marketing and branding, which is so very important because we need to educate the audience about the story behind our cultural, our cultural productions and also the efforts in hacking into the social networks amongst the cultural audience also matter. So um, the most important thing probably is, is not about creating the cultural products, but, all, but it will lies in the efforts of the cultural entrepreneurs to cooperate in how people interpret the meaning, how people understanding the, the meaning behind their, their cultural uh, products. So I'm going to skip, uh, skip some details given time limitation. And the last part will be the cultural elements in situation in the existing cultural system and how it, the cultural products can become the new cultural elements that can fit into the future uh, cultural productions. So uh, we believe that um, uh, cultural institutionalization is a process that uh, allows the creative content transform into the new cultural elements. And then, um, but to do this, there are two efforts that should be done, such as we have to uh, establish, to make sure that the shared experience of the symbolic meaning will remain, and also the formation of the cultural memory. Only when people already have some existing experience and knowledge and understanding about the cultural meaning, they will, we can create the, um, this kind of echoing effects in their minds when they first to, uh, when they, uh, experience the new culture producing uh, products or surface based on their um, their understanding before. So, uh, but this experience is, is a co-produced mechanism based on the interaction between the cultural goods and these consumers. Again, when the consumers um, have experience to a cultural products or cultural services, they will create their own unique understanding. And this unique understanding will also uh, influence and evolve after the interaction between the, all the consumers in the greater market. So this is the general process from the shared experience of symbolic meaning to the cultural memory and to the new cultural elements. So it's all about creating the, um, the feeling that uh, you understand the, um, the meaning behind the, the cultural ideas and then you can better appreciate 
the value that uh, the, the cultural entrepreneurs try to convey. And all put, put all our idea together, we propose this circular model of the cultural economic trajectories from the cultural productions to meaning discovery and the cultural industrialization. And uh, feel, uh, please find the details in our articles uh, because the time limitation, I'm going, not going to uh, talk about uh, the cases that we use, so which is the K-pop. We use the K-pop music industry as a case to explain how this, uh, this kind of uh, circular model works. And um, in this paper, I think the most important thing is that uh, our, we can contribute to the better understanding how to the business model developments for the, all the cultural entrepreneurs. Uh, most of them try their best to, in order to de uh, develop the very unique and with uh, products or with the high uh, art artistic value. But it is also very important for them to create the connection between their cultural, under cultural products and understanding of the markets. So simply put, we have to educate the cultural audience in order to let them can reappreciate the meaning and the value behind our cultural products. So uh, this is a brief uh, sharing of our work. So um, uh, thank you very much for your attentions and uh, I look forward to having your feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, perfect timing. <clears throat> and uh, thank you also for uh, <clears throat> um, uh, taking all uh, on, on you uh, this, uh, this presentation, also on behalf of Jason. Um, so uh, quite different perspectives. Uh, uh, so cultural value, social value, market value. Uh, in the first presentation, uh, we had uh, a clear focus uh, uh, besides uh, the, the cultural value on the social value and how the uh, and what are the underlying mechanisms. Uh, while uh, in in the second presentation, uh, uh, the major stress uh, besides cultural value is on uh, the market value. Uh, so, but I I can see uh, interesting uh, intersections. Uh, uh, in the two uh, uh, different approaches, also one based on communication and practice, the other one on uh, on economics. Um, so um, uh, I would like really uh, the, uh, the the two groups of, of presenters uh, uh, to really uh, see uh, what they uh, see the major intersections uh, and synergies between the two approaches. Uh, and of course, I would like to invite uh, um, uh, the audience uh, if they have any questions, comments uh, to intervene by raising their hands or they can also uh, write uh, their comments or questions uh, in the chat. Uh, okay, uh, shall we start with Jen uh, and, uh, and while uh, the presenters uh, think about uh, my, my main question? Please, Jen. Thank you. Um, well, well, thank you to both presenters for really interesting papers. And um, as uh, Elisabetta was saying, I'm seeing interesting synergies between the, the two um, already. Um, I guess my, my question um, goes to, to both. Um, and thinking about what we would call craft in the South African context, um, one of the, the challenges is, um, as you were saying, meaning, but also authenticity. So uh, what makes um, a craft product um, meaningful and authentic? Okay? So is it the person who, who makes it? Is it the way that it's explained or marketed, um, maybe? Um, and then... Yeah, what I was really wondering about while you were talking about the Jaipur rugs um, example was, um, did, did they say that they had to make some difficult choices at some point where there was a clash between, say, a market or commercial opportunity and um, their own uh, philosophy of um, social value? Thank you. I guess one thing I'll start with, thank you for your question. Um, is I, I think we were um, really thinking about and very interested in um, how the craft, if you will, and meaning and authenticity, uh, the words that you use, 
how those were so sort of indigenous in um, the founder's vision. So that was sort of how we really tracked some of those elements of the meaning was really in regard to this um, appreciation of the um, kind of indigenous art of the weavers. And, you know, despite a lot of the social stigma of their class, of the caste, of some of the, the um, sort of limitations, um, that there was a, a, a beauty, there was an inherent sense of a beauty and story. And it was almost as though both for NKC and I think in our research methods, it was more that meaning was sort of being um, kind of uncovered um, from the original stories of these weavers as opposed to sort of imbuing a meaning uh, externally. Um, so I don't know for my co-presenters, if you wanna add anything in regard to, you know, um, I guess that second part of the question uh, in regard to when there have been conflicts between sort of what the market would want versus sort of this idea of scaling up these more sort of spiritual ideas and cultural values. So I think uh, I can answer that question. Uh, so perhaps uh, in, at Jaipur Drugs, we have, as I said, through Jaipur Drugs Foundation, we sort of focused on uh, socially developing our artisans where we actually provide them training as to how the market trends are going, right? So while they have the freedom to sort of, uh, uh, so that's that's where we sort of distinguish our artisans uh, from laborers to, uh, you know, uh, from artisans because we sort of give them that exposure to actually visit Jaipur, actually visit our sales team and our stores to just see how the market trends are working. And we sort of give them that freedom to uh, experience how they are interpreting the market trends and how they are sort of seeing a change in the pattern. So it's perhaps we are also giving them training uh, in terms of making better designs uh, thinking more creatively and enhancing their creative ability. So I think uh, uh, as uh, Alex also mentioned, it's also about creating uh, that sensitivity in the culture or cultural audiences, right? So by sharing their experiences, by sharing their stories through our branding, we are all actually making the audiences uh, uh, aware about their work. And also we are actually doing the other thing where we are actually making them aware, aware about how the market trends are going and how the designs are working. So, yeah. I guess this is, okay. Uh, uh, Boren, do you want to share uh, your thoughts first? Uh, I've got a question for the first presentation um, first. Uh, for uh, some of the rocks are quite Excuse contemporary. Excuse me, Borama, I think yeah. that Alex was uh, responding to the first question. Uh, ah, if, if sorry. Please wait. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I can, yeah, thank you so much. I can give a quick response. Uh, thank you, uh, Jen, for the, the great questions. And also, I have, a, I think I have some common ideas that uh, I've just mentioned by Joanne and uh, um, really, uh, you know, in the, the crab industry, I mean, those indigenous people, they already have a lot of authenticity, right? Because they are from their region, they are from their tribes. So they, when they build the kind of things, they already uh, imbue their creations with their uh, cultural ideation. But uh, as you mentioned, marketer, or in our terms, cultural entrepreneurs, their job is to, uh, you know, try to identify those cultural uh, cultural authenticity and try to convert this authenticity into the meaning that the audience can really understand and appreciate. So their job is not about uh, trying to just market the thing, everything, but help them to understand, interpret the implicit meaning that the cultural creators would like to convey in their products. And this is my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Bohram, uh, did you have a question? <laughs> Sorry, I, I wasn't really following. <laughs> but then, um, for, uh, I'm sorry for my um, ignorance, but then I guess those craft people are born into their job. Am I right? Or not? They, they're born into... Um, anyway, I'll carry on my question. Uh, so, I, you know, they've, they've got, you know, they're obviously craftsmen and then they've um, got all this history and knowledge. And then I see some designs are quite modern. So I'm just asking, do they go through modernization as part of their kind of entrepreneurial approach to 
developing products and then you know i find you know that something that will be quite central to this discussion yeah and how open so, are they yeah I think yeah, this is a question for the first uh, group of presenters. Uh, so I think, uh, as I said, that you know, Jaipur Rugs actually has a CSR wing, which is called the Jaipur Rugs Foundation, which focuses on uh, artisans, especially because, as you said, uh, do they follow a modern design or the traditional design? Well, uh, you can see that you know this rug weaving practice has been a generational, uh, you know, art which they have been doing for almost up you know multiple years 2500 year old technique so they have been doing it for a lot of years so but what happens is that uh, while they're doing continuously there are other livelihood opportunities which they are getting and since you know the market trends keep on increasing and developing since if they don't have the have a good idea good enough idea as to how the designs are developing then there are no one to purchase their rugs right i mean you need to actually uh, be a uh, uh, continuously align yourself to the market trends and the design. So as I said, uh, with our Jaipur Rux Foundation, we have a design innovation lab right in their villages where uh, there are a lot of design designers and you know international designers which we bring in, try to actually make them literate about uh, how the trends are working, how the modern designs are working, and you know try to draw inspirations from their surroundings and nature and as I said, these uh, Manchaha rugs, where they are the creator and the designers of their own rugs, have got their own uniqueness and, you know, have got their own unique sort of story to tell. So I think, uh, so it's sort of, we are sort of integrating the market trends in the design. We are also creating a new market with this, these unique designs, which they are actually designing. So, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. I don't know if uh, Joanny or Hit would like to, to add on that. In the meantime, uh, uh, let's welcome Jason. Uh, hello, welcome uh, among us. Uh, hello, Jason. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Have I come in an hour late? Have I just, or is this? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but oh, no. don't worry because Alex uh, did a great job. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry about that, everyone. So we are I was only... in my diary for 5 p.m. Uh, yeah, GMT. In fact, it's almost 6 a.m. Anyway, don't never mind. Uh, so we are in the middle of the conversation. Uh, so we were talking about... Uh, uh we, we are comparing the two uh, uh presentations uh, so i don't know if uh, um um and heat would like to add on uh, on uh, uh, the previous uh, reply yeah, yeah i think so uh okay. yeah, i think so just adding on personally visiting the art and seeing the artists personally was a different experience because they bring in a lot of their personal stories in the art. So there is definitely a cultural um, component that they add to the art that uh, their personal lives kind of inspire them to. But uh, there is another platform that the foundation or the enterprise is giving them is to help them reach these rugs to a global platform. So when that initiative comes in to bring those maths and rugs to a global platform they try to inculcate different types of stories different types of patterns and the training process that they go through from Jaipur Rugs Foundation definitely brings in a little bit of you know a uh, modern touch as you would say to their entrepreneurial or their artisanal journey so you do see a different kind of variation from the traditional one to the modern ones that kind of reach that global platform but it's in all in all i think a lot of the personal stories that are reaching the global level and one thing if i might uh, more broadly in connect connecting across the papers um, some of the similarities that i heard um, even as we look at social socially constructed meaning um, as well as the idea too of that um, that third phase as i understand it uh, in regard to um, your model, that the notion of institutionalization 
um, is also um, similar to um, the four flows, uh, the final flow of the four of this constituted communication is really how you, you, you take these ideas that are sort of starting as conversation and through communication and micro practices, they become, they reach not only vertically than um, the global sphere, but you start to see more of an institutionalization of the social and the cultural values um, as they become integrated more into the institutions and the social structure of the organization more broadly. So again, I just wanted to point out those were two common constructs that I think that both of our presentations use as the idea of um, the assumption of socially constructed reality or meaning, uh, as well as the institutionalization being sort of like that, that third phase, that final phase. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, in fact, in order to achieve this institutional institutionalization, which is uh, uh, the ultimate uh, goal, uh, seemingly of the two approaches uh, uh, in, in the paper by uh, Alex and Jason, uh, uh, you talk about object activity uh, with respect to the uh, customer's uh, subjectivity. Uh, can you please elaborate on that? How can you achieve uh, this kind of uh, uh, objectivity? Or, uh, uh, or do you take it uh, uh, for granted? Can you please uh, explain uh, that? Perhaps this is a question for Jason. So. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. And again, look, apologies, everyone, for coming in late. I was, I was in my diary for 10 minutes from now. Um, but again, uh, thank you, Alex, for, for stepping up and postponing your class. But if, um, no, look, this is, um, and again, apologies if we've sort of already discussed these themes. But I mean, what, what, why I like this idea, and again, um, this is sort of something that Alex really developed a lot of this thinking on this, is the difference between artistic creativity, which is you know, in the sort of Rick Rubin sort of sense of artists sort of looking at the world and, and interpreting it and creating, you know, in a short sort of, um, you know, constructing value directly in that sense. Um, and separating that out from the entrepreneurial task, which is not the creation of value. It's not even the creation of intersubjective value because what the artist is doing is interpreting the world in such a way that the audience and consumers and 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 um, the you know the, the the demand side of that of that artistic creation are responding to. So we've got artistic creation objective, artistic um, consumption intersubjective. What the entrepreneur is doing is noticing in the in the Kosnerian entrepreneurial sense that something was happening there. That there was there was a sort of and, and this is the moment at which economic value surfaces in a sense for the first time um, as opposed to into subjective value or creative value or or, or um, you know, meaning being created. Um, the entrepreneurial role then is to notice that that conversation is taking place between artist and audience and and that and that, and that um, subjective meaning or subjective cultural value is being created to. Um, make an entrepreneurial claim that there is an, a, a, there is some economic value there that can be further created, captured, and so on, thus beginning the institutionalization process. And you know, the, the very crude form of that is that the, the manager, the, you know, the manager of the band or whatever, sort of sees that and you know, sees, I think there's something here, we can do something with that, and off they go. But what we're doing is wanting to take that, that concept and push it right to its limits and say that, that that's not just you know uh, a, an agent doing something or a firm doing something on behalf of someone else but this is the beginning of 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 market value being created and dis or discovered being, being discovered i'd emphasize there um and then putting into place economic resources drawing economic resources in sort of building institutions around that and what you have then is a kind of co-creation of value where you've got artistic you know and the the thing that we were pushing back against was the sort of schumpeterian notion of artist as entrepreneur and i think that's a you know it's a seductive interesting idea but it's fundamentally wrong because what it what it does is it sort of it, it actually undervalues both artistic creativity and entrepreneurial creativity by pushing them together and um what the you know what, what this but this notion of the, you know, the, the but there is still a, a, a trajectory at play here, but it is a trajectory where the cultural entrepreneur 
um, is is acting to sort of create markets and create ins economic institutions to um, develop that initial that create the, that uh, discovery of 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 um, of creative of, of creative cultural value that's being produced. Now, you know, very long um, way of answering your question of where the subjective, objective, and subjective sort of fits in here. But what's actually going on is that there's two layers of of, of that question. There's a creative meaning, or there's a cultural meaning, objective, and subjective, and 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 an intersubjective realization of that. Um, and then there's the economic discover or the economic value discovery, which again is starts as subjective, becomes sort of intersubjective through the process, eventually, hopefully, maybe it ends up as a objective value that's being captured in you know markets and prices and so on. Um, so I think you know, in a sense, what we're really doing, what this sort of framework really does is just point out that there's actually a lot going on um, at, at, at least two different layers of value that are interacting. And you know, I think this is kind of a first path at trying to um, unpack the way in which the sort of Austrian, um, you know, Kozneri and entrepreneurial theory intersect or, or, of creative industries intersect with the sort of Schumpeteri and evolutionary theory of creative industries intersect with the cultural economics intersection of, of this and put them all into together into one horrible framework that that um, at least sort of maps out what we think is going on with the value creation process and how it sort of starts in one place how you know the entrepreneurial role is in a particular point that triggers market institutions to, to interact on that so I mean how we see this is um, that this is kind of a laying out of what I think is an ongoing research program trying to understand what those value cycles and institutionalization processes are and you know to my mind the main contribution here was to really indicate the complexity of, of this you know how cultural value turns into economic value it's a far more complex process than i think either cultural economics or the sort of schumpeterian evolutionary economics version of that have, 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 have understood but the key thing to unpack was that it was this but well, the key thing that was new in, in, in this framework was the economic entrepreneur is discovering not economic value, but meaning that was created by the cultural creator. Like that's the new link that wasn't there before. Um, and, it, and again, that, that might seem sort of an obvious point from other fields, but it was a, I think it's a new point in, at least in economics. Thank you, Giselle. So are you suggesting that uh, entrepreneurs are separate entities from uh, artists? Yes, yes, I, I think that's where this goes. And that's interesting because sort of original cultural economics didn't really have a tight connection between the artistic creator and the entrepreneur. It was it was more the firm or, or industry. It was a it was very much a scaling up or providing resources. There wasn't entrepreneurial discovery. And then around the so you know, this is the Tyler Cohen type literature, we started to see this notion of um, of, you know, but entrepreneur, but but artists are behaving like entrepreneurs, and that sort of connected up the um, sort of Austrian slash Tyler Cohen George Mason University evolutionary Schumpeterian version of creative industries, in which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, for my sins, I think partially responsible for some of that some of that approach. But what we've sort of realised is that that was an oversimplification in a different direction, and the the. You know, the true model is actually more complex that it's it's two layers of entrepreneurship it's sort of artistic creativity for meaning creating and then it's economic entrepreneurship in the Kersnerian sense for noticing that meaning creating but it's not meaning creating in the just look at this amazing piece of art it's meaning creating look at the intersubjective way that the audience is responding to that and that's the entrepreneurial insight that then begins the sort of economic value creation process and not before that. So it's not that the economic entrepreneur is discovering the artist. It's that the economic entrepreneur is discovering that the artist has discovered value themselves in their interactions with, with the audience. And you know, again, that's, that's not a simple model at all and we haven't really developed it, but um, you know, in, in the paper, um, and this is this is Alex's and, and your team's work. Um, look at K-pop as a sort of a, an example of you know where you can sort of see that playing out. But we're starting to see. I'm sort of starting to see it a lot. And I, I do a lot of work in um, 
Web3 stuff now. You're seeing it also in the memification of a lot of Web3 communities, that they are a lot of the economic organization of Web3 is actually done through memes and other, you know, other straightforward visual creative communication. So um, I think, yeah, again, the um, sort of seeing this as as a the beginning of a of, of an ongoing research program um, rather than just sort of something that, that tidies up previous ones. Very interesting uh, conversation in the chat. Uh, Jenny suggesting uh, uh, about uh, cultural intermediaries uh, and and related the research uh, uh, with which uh, Alex uh, agree. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have to come to an end uh, because the hour has already passed. Um, so very uh, insightful dialogue between uh, two different. Uh, uh, disciplinary and uh, theoretical perspectives, uh, so communication uh, uh, based on practice. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to Jaipur Rags uh, Foundation for uh, uh, their presence here. It's always uh, important uh, uh, to be tested and to work together to co create uh, uh, theory based on, uh, on practice for the sake of practice. Um, uh, so communication practice, uh, cultural economics. Uh, um, so we uh, discussed about uh, cultural value, social value, and uh, market value with different uh, emphasis on the three uh, dimensions uh, uh, to come up to a, a common, a rather com common goal, which is uh, the uh, institute institutionalization. Uh, uh, of artists. Uh, uh, are artists entrepreneurs? Uh, uh, yes, no, are the two roles separate? Uh, we also discussed that. Uh, I would like to thank very much again, uh, Juani Walker, Hita Godazara, and Mo Rumai Mohan, sorry for my pronunciation, Alex Yu Yu Chang, and uh, Jason Potts uh, for their valuable, uh, very valuable uh, uh, insights. And uh, please uh, don't, uh, uh, and we look forward, uh, of course, we also uh, thank very much uh, the audience uh, uh, for the presence, for their uh, very interesting uh, questions and comments. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time for the next uh, cultural economics uh, seminar. Thank you so much and have a nice uh, rest of the day or of the evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.